I'm really pleased to present to you guys Gary Nell. Gary is the CEO of um, Sesame Workshop. Um, Sesame Street, I'm sure which you guys all grew up on, um, was started in 1969 under the premise that kids would have a better time learning with some fun, some I think what they called fizz and pop. Um, and um, in the 40 years, it's actually uh, Sesame Street's 40th year anniversary this year, um, in the 40 years since it started, I think Sesame Street's in 140 countries across six continents and reaches 100 million kids. Um, and this year was the launch of the new electric company. I don't know how many of you guys are old enough to remember the electric company, but I am. It was one of my favorite things growing up. So I'm um, very excited to have it back. And Gary's going to tell you guys a little bit about um, what Sesame Workshop is doing education across the world right now. So without any further ado, here's Gary. Good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning, everyone watching. Um, you can tell I'm f from New York because I'm in a suit. So, uh, but um, we'll do um, the best we can today to uh, give you a little bit of a tour of the longest street in the world. Um, Google has mapped the world, as we know, but we like to think that we're the the contiguous avenue that people have walked down now around the world in 140 countries. So basically, this is an organization that started 40 years ago. Um, and uh, it was really out of the civil rights movement in this country when we had an era of uh, race riots, political assassinations. Thank you. Um, we had uh, extreme challenges in terms of educational gaps. We had a unpopular war. And it was a time when President Johnson started what was referred to at the time the War on Poverty, which is probably not so dissimilar to some of the talk you're hearing in Washington today. And out of the War on Poverty came a uh, set of federal initiatives like Head Start. There was no really uh, organized child care program that uh, was funded for those in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods, things like VISTA, things like the Job Corps, which were the AmeriCorps of their time, uh, and the, the Teach for Americas of their time, I guess. And even NPR and PBS came out of that era as well. So um, Sesame Street was really invented at a dinner party one night by a television producer in New York who was a documentarian and a foundation executive who knew by observation that kids were learning from television. It wasn't a question of whether they were learning, it was a question of what were they le learning. And that um, they, in fact, could try to embed some educational content in an engaging way, in the same way advertising and certain comedy and variety shows were being produced at the time, in a way to sell letters and numbers, which is where the whole thing came from brought to you by the letter B. Now, I noticed Vice President Biden over the weekend was at the gridiron dinner, and he mentioned, actually, in his talk that he has a new office in the West Wing, and it happens to be right next to Rahm Emanuel, and the walls are quite paper thin. He said every morning is like Sesame Street brought to you by the letter F, you know? <laughs> so we, we stay relevant in the 21st century. Um, we really addressed this mission of early childhood education of kids most in need. And, you know, the show seems probably something that you're very familiar with. But 40 years ago, it was truly revolutionary. The first program to really have a African-American couple as a role model with a young child. The first program to have, feature a Hispanic couple. Um, I like to say that Luis and Maria are the world's longest telenovela still going on. And, um, and they're still around. And I think Gabby is probably now ready for Social Security herself. But um, we, we have a, a wonderful legacy that's gone on. And the show really connected different ethnicities, uh, different family structures, uh, big tall yellow canaries and green grouches on a common street in which people could be interdependent and get along. And in fact, um, the show was banned in the state of Mississippi the first year because it showed an integrated neighborhood that was um, truly um, 
a positive role model. It was an experiment that really worked, and we brought together educators from the Harvard Graduate School of Education who knew nothing about television, right, Lewis? And the television producers who probably didn't know a heck of a lot about education. And at the time, this was really a, a monumental experiment that you could embed television for children with educational content. It, it seems so normal to us now, but at the time it was really revolutionary. And this whole wheel over here, which was called the CTW model at the time for the Children's Television Workshop, combined this idea of formative testing to you know, find out children's needs, to try to adapt some approaches to those, and uh, to, to actually write to the plot line on um, teach, different teaching topics, which I'll show you, um, to go in and uh, produce those shows and then do a full circle and evaluate them so that you have evaluative research from the beginning. It's probably not so dissimilar than a lot of the work you do here at Google. And I am stuck. Whoops. So, um, what most people don't know is that um, Sesame Street, and now I'm jumping all over, Sesame Street is um, you know, now in 140 countries around the world. And in many of these countries, we are dealing with um, pretty tough to teach topics, which um, like HIV and AIDS in South Africa. And what we've done there is, uh, what we have done in, in South Africa is to deal with stigmatization, um, where you have one in nine kids who are HIV positive, and we're able to create an HIV positive Muppet, actually named Kemi, um, who can deal with stigma and show kids that you can be uh, friends with them or play with them and not necessarily get sick. So this is a, a really important role model who's become a UNICEF champion for children or working in Egypt around girls' education where 60% of the female population is illiterate. We can create a Muppet there named Hoha who is a role model who wants to grow up to be a lawyer or a doctor or work at Google or something, but as someone who is really a positive role model for young children. And then working in places like um, Northern Ireland where we have um, now uh, built a program for the first time which can um, connect children who are not exposed. You know, only 10% or so of the kids in Northern Ireland go to so-called integrated schools between Catholics and Protestants. And um, what we are able to do in the privacy of one's own living room is to use the power of media through live action films to show um, that a Catholic child and a Protestant child is probably not that different. They both get up in the morning, they get up in the morning. They go to school, they go to school. They go to church, they go to church. They come home, they have dinner, they, uh, they do their homework. And all of a sudden, when you are exposed to the other side, it's much harder to hate someone. And we know through work at Queen's University in Belfast that um, children as young as three years of age, as it says, are showing signs of these emerging sectarian attitudes and discriminating against parties of the other side. So through the power of media, we were able to juxtapose these um, different ethnic groups and um, have a, a really powerful dynamic that we've just started there. Um, in India, which has over 150 million preschoolers, um, we're able to uh, develop a new show called Gali Gali Sim Sim, which is a Hindi version of, of Sesame Street. All of these are really not driven out of New York. They're driven by local partners who are able to develop a curriculum and, uh, and, and are able to then produce the show, in this case, in Delhi. What you're seeing here is um, one of the projects that we've done with help from the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, who have... Um, helped us go into slums in Mumbai and Delhi and other cities um, with the program where kids might not otherwise be exposed to it and to show off some of the work that we're doing through mobile vans and to take these into creches um, like you're seeing here to drive home um, local lessons and important lessons about uh, literacy and basic education or about health messages as simple as basic hygiene like wa washing your hands. And in Bangladesh, I love this picture. This is a collaboration with S Save the Children where our local production Sisampur is, um, is being watched here 
uh, on a mobile viewing platform, which is brought to a village on a rickshaw. So this is really basic technology coming, coming right home. And it doesn't get a lot more basic than this. And you can see the crowds of kids who have gathered around to watch an episode of Sissampur here. And I think it's hard for us sometimes as we live in this highly technological environment here in the US to imagine um, what some of these things are looking like. And I, I would suggest that those of you who are really changing the world through technology and content um, continue to think about applications that are going to be mobile in, uh, in distribution and, and effectiveness in reaching kids in these developing countries who are really in greatest need. That is exactly where Sesame Workshop is going. So in 1969, obviously, it was a television program. And you can see here Bert and Ernie having a good time. That sort of looks like a, a radio with a TV in it. But anyway, it's supposed to be a TV. Um, and now we've expanded really in, a, in what I'd like to call an agnostic way toward um, new forms of distribution, including um, podcasts, which we're nearing now a million downloads a week. We've got the number one preschool podcast in the, in the world, in Sesame Street, um, often featured by your friends down the street at Apple on their um, iTunes store. Um, where, what we've been able to do is over the 40 years in developing new content, but also have a 40-year four, rich history of some 4,000 plus hours of library material where you can basically get the best of Grover, the best of Cookie Monster, or the best of Big Bird, um, or divvied up by different subject matters, d uh, put into a programming module that we then distribute through our website at, PBS, at sesamestreet.org or through pbskids.org. And we're hitting about 2.2 million unique users a month um, between those two. Um, we've got a major VOD platform with uh, Comcast in which we've launched a channel called Sprout, which some of you may, may have seen, which is getting about 18 million video downloads a month. So what we're seeing here is the use of television and probably in the world in which YouTube exists, um, this will uh, it'd probably be a temporary phenomenon, but um, the, the download through the cable box right now has become an extremely popular way for moms or dads who come home at 6, 17 in the evening and want to cook dinner and have their children watch an episode of Sesame Street. So they've been able to do that, and then we're working in these different capacities with people like the Vcast platform at Verizon um, and others at Sprint, et cetera. Our website has some really interesting features. Um, we've created something called PlaySafe, which is a bit of a walled garden where parents can leave their preschoolers and not worry about wandering. And as some of us have been talking about this, obviously the, the advantage of having a preschooler on the web is their, their lack of basic literacy skills makes it a little hard for them to type into places that they probably don't belong. So this is a way for them to engage with um, their favorite characters in a, in a wonderful way through a very, very basic interaction on, on the website um, and move around to um, many of these games that we have launched on the web, all having a curricular uh, uh, approach, whether it's in uh, literacy or numeracy or what have you. Um, and then, of course, on YouTube, um, of course, I'm, I'm not supposed to say this, but the most popular video has been before he got into trouble. Um, Chris Brown <laughs> did a video with Elmo, which um, I think the last count on that was about 15 million YouTube downloads. And it has the capability, as you can see, this is with Feist, who is also on the show. And her video in just a, a month, or less than a month, had almost a million hits. So, we're looking at um, YouTube as you know, a phenomenon which has been able to expand Sesame Street's educational mission in ways that we probably could not have imagined um, prior to its invention. And we now have estimated 4.5 million total downloads. Um, 
with the podcasts and VOD and cell phone content. And the only point I'm putting these up here is just to show you that as we have been traditional media producers in creating um, a one-hour television program, we have now been able to follow along and at least um, expand our work because the show was originally built as a magazine program to have our work appearing on all of these different platforms which are mirroring the world in which you work in every day um, so that as technology gets faster, smaller, and cheaper, um, we're able to be there um, wherever people are with the characters, the iconic characters that they have begun, that they have become to love over the years. So I just want to show you a couple other applications here. This is a, um, those of you who, who are, who know something about um, early education, um, one of the greatest gaps right now is around vocabulary. And as, we, and as the state of California, for instance, has now unfortunately fallen into 48th of 50 states in terms of academic achievement in its public schools, which is an embarrassment, having grown up myself as a public school kid in California. Um, we now know that high school graduation, which is the greatest indicator of stay, staying out of poverty, really can get rooted back to fourth grade achievements and even rooted back as young as birth of a, of a mom reading and speaking, rather, to a newborn child to begin to build those literacy capabilities within that child. So a vocabulary gap has now uh, developed over a time in which um, poor families uh, as a whole, there are literally thousands of words that economically disadvantaged um, households and the kids who come from them have versus so-called professional families. And um, what we've tried to do is use the power of celebrity uh, to uh, engage kids calling, creating something new called what's the word on the street and we've got folks like Jack Black and um, David Beckham and all these other stars on the show to promote different words on the street to basically give parents a, a teaching tool and an inspiration to kind of play with words and move that thing out there. And then we're proud also to have jumped in now to try to help second and third graders especially um, de uh, pr promote and give them literacy skills through the electric company, which some of you may remember. It's a big show in the 1970s. You can sing the song, I'm sure, right? Uh, <laughs> and um, we've got um, a new cast of terrific young cast members. And then we've gotten a lot of stars and celebrities to do uh, cameos, um, including people like Wyclef Jean and Jimmy Fallon and Sean Kingston and, and others to come on the show and really give an homage, for instance, to the letter, to the silent E at the end of a, at the end of a word, or uh, finding ways to drop and slide different letters in different words to create word combinations. And the Electro Company, we're really proud of it, launched on KQED and around the country in January on a weekly basis. It will be stripped every day starting this fall, and we're, work, we're gonna be working in over two dozen cities across America to really hone in on making an impact through after school programs and um, through uh, uh, schools themselves to try to get kids motivated around a love of learning. And I think I've got a little clip um, from the electric company to show you as we help kids make this transition from learning to read, which is what the early years of education are, to reading to learn. And we know now that if they're not if they're not literate uh, by the age, by the third or fourth grade, the chances of them ever catching up and going on to graduate in high school really fall off the map. And now we know that in Los Angeles, some 70% of Hispanic children not graduating high school. And how in the world are these kids ever going to survive in employment possibilities, in healthcare and energy and the other areas that are you know, potential growth engines for this country moving forward. 
So we want to make an impact here, and we think the electric company is one way to do that. It's divided into phonemic awareness, vocabulary issues, um, comprehension of connected text, but most importantly, motivation. And how do we get kids really motivated about learning and, and give teachers an extra set of tools to really get those kids who might not otherwise see a connection to, to make that happen. The strategy is to produce this on a broad set of platforms, and this is where I think you know, things like YouTube can come in incredibly handy as we move from simply a television program uh, onto these different platforms where kids can do mashups, they can create their own raps, rhymes, comic strips. We have outreach activities with a, uh, as I mentioned, with the Boys and Girls Clubs and the Urban Libraries Council and others, and of course, portable media and console games. So we want to use every technological tool um, that can uh, express the, um, the, the content of the electric company moving forward. Here are some of the guest stars that I mentioned. There, there are more. Um, Tiki Barber was in the office the other day, who's now an NBC um, correspondent on the Today Show, and he just can't do enough for this program because I think this is a way for a lot of these stars to give back and to make a difference in young children's lives. Um, the, this is the website, which is, seems to be growing. We're on YouTube and iTunes now. And we're, this 360-degree literacy experience is, is being promoted through um, a set of materials which can be downloaded as well as being given out in, in um, print capabilities through some of the national partnerships that you see up on this board. So let's take a quick look at the electric company, get a feel. I'm 
So that gives you a little idea. Trust me, it's a lot better with real audio. <laughs> but um, 4.30 Friday afternoon on KQED, and um, I hope, Kristen, we can have it piped into all of Google tomorrow. So let's see what we can do. Um, so we're um, excited about um, the electric company, and I just wanted to show you a couple last things here um, to give you some idea of what we're also doing as we move forward. We did a We've done some studies with mobile learning, and um, part of what we have been able to do is to use the mobile phone as a teaching tool to, for instance, promote uh, the alphabet as basic literacy by uh, distributing uh, phones to moms in certain economically disadvantaged neighborhoods under the condition that they would have their children exposed to a different letter of the day video through their mobile phone. And some 80% of those moms viewed it as a really helpful way. So you can use these devices really as a way of carrying uh, new lessons for, for education to, um, to the public. Um, and this is an example of what we were able to do through letter recognition activities and letter sound activities as well. And, um, we're also really proud of the new Joan Gans Cooney Center uh, at Sesame Workshop, which was started in honor of our founder and the executive director, Dr. Michael Levine, is here. Michael, raise your hand. And Ann Tai, who works with Michael. Um, and we're happy that, uh, thrilled actually, that we will be um, co hosting an event this October here at Google. Uh, to, which will bring in um, educators and technologists from around the world to really talk about the power of uh, media and innovation to drive learning. Um, we probably face the greatest educational crisis in our lifetimes in this country um, as we live in an interconnected world where um, kids are going to need new skills that um, the schools have just not been able to build for them up to now. So figuring out a way in which we can um, get the best minds of not only Silicon Valley, but people from all over the world to focus on the use of gaming platforms, um, to grab the energy that's up at the Moscone Center this week, and to focus that energy so we can move from a culture of Grand Theft Auto to a culture of Grand Theft Elmo. Um, perhaps we can um, make a big difference, and we're really really grateful to, to the folks at Google who have welcomed us here to present uh, at that forum this fall, and I hope um, some of you can join us for that. Um, Michael and his colleagues have produced several um, uh, 
different studies. Um, I don't know if you have copies of this, Michael, but it's available and Ann has them. These are um, about mobile learning and some of the innovations. And, and it's really more for the public to kind of open their eyes as people tend to look at these technologies and these instruments as um, one or unidimensional. And what we're trying to do is to expand people's view and scope of them so that people can view those as really educational tools because we know just as the founders of Sesame Street knew that television was a huge magnetic attraction for young kids, we know now, and any of you who have kids know, that um, they are more proficient on use of these devices than, um, than most adults are, and certainly teachers. So some of the challenges we are you know, trying to focus on here are these that come up in mobile learning, and then we focus on opportunities at the same time in reaching underserved kids, in improving 21st century social interactions, and extending learning environments. This is a way in which we can really get these things launched. Um, what we're trying to do at the center is to move from a research and development um, cap capacity uh, towards a preparation and actual implementation of a lot of what we're doing so that we can move to create a culture where um, these devices can be used to promote um, learning on a much broader scale. And then finally, we have a really special birthday coming up. Um, the 40th of Sesame Street is, is coming up, and um, it's hard to believe um, on November 10th of 2009 this year, we will premiere um, the first show of what we call the 40th experimental season of Sesame Street. And just as many of you here at Google are working on all these incredible innovations, such as the ones we just witnessed with Google Earth as an example, um, we like to think of ourselves as innovators and experimenters as well. And we, we literally view every season as a new experimental season of, of what we're trying to do. And we would love, just as um, Dr. Seuss and others were able to do recently, and this is for the marketing people here, um, to take a look for the 40th birthday on November 10th, 2009. How cool would it be to go to the homepage and see, literally, as Lewis reminded me, the Muppets' uh, googly eyes, as they are, I believe, described in the trademark application. So we might either have a really great lawsuit against you guys, or, uh, which we would undoubtedly lose, um, or um, better yet, we could settle it by having a fantastic homepage on November 10th, 2009. And we've just mocked this up as, a, as some examples. So we hope that Count Von Count um, can count you in. And I just want to close and thank you for coming today and happy to answer any questions. Um, I want to close uh, to just show you uh, one final sort of quick two-minute tour of the longest street in the world and how Sesame Street is approaching global challenges and global issues um, to use the power of media to help children reach their highest potential. Thanks very much. It's not whether children learn from television, it's what children learn from television. Because everything that children see on television is teaching them something. These days, we take the power of television for granted. But back in 1968, it took a group of visionaries to recognize that this power could also be used for good. One of the things we wanted was to give poor children the same break that middle class children were getting in terms of arriving in school with some preparation. Sesame Street was called nothing short of a revolution in children's programming. Today, we're using the power of media. That's great! And the power of Muppets in more than 140 countries. Partnering with local educators and artists, we are creating programs that address the real needs of children all over the world. Already more than 5 million South Africans are HIV positive. HIV and AIDS is very much a part of every child's reality. Using the 
we felt that if you brought in an HIV muppet, then you have to to take it through. Well, Zigwe, this is a memory box that my mom made for me before she died of AIDS. Oh, yes. Even a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old needs to have some recognition or understanding of what this thing is. Kemi, we know that we cannot catch HIV just by being your friend. And I have much more fun when I play with my friends. It's pretty clear that there's a need for preschool education in Bangladesh because there's very little available. If you just think of the mathematics of what we're doing, 130 million people, there's one television station, and it has an 80% reach. How can you not profoundly change the life of these children? The fragile peace in Kosovo is shattered. Ethnic... We really believe that a Sesame Project could aid in the peace process. I think it would be irresponsible, to be honest, not to start trying to do something with preschool children now in the realm of building peace and tolerance. Even if Sesame can't completely convert them, if you like, into, into being openly accepting um, of each other, at least when they grow up to be parents, they'll be more tolerant than their parents were, and the next generation will have a much better chance. Our mission is to give children everywhere the skills needed to succeed, including the emotional tools to handle life's more difficult situations. We learned that children were suffering from sadness, confusion, and anxiety. And we felt that we could create some powerful new teaching tools to connect soldiers and their families. Today, we're there for military families, helping the nearly three quarters of a million preschoolers cope with the challenges of deployment. Are you proud of your mommy and daddy? Yeah, I'm most proud of I'm most mommy and daddy too. And tomorrow? Tomorrow, we'll be doing whatever we can, wherever we can, to bring new hope and opportunity to children. Sesame is striving to give every child the right to read, the right to literacy, the right to education. I mean, that is, that is incredible. When our producers travel around the world, they are indeed on a mission. Whether they're teaching tolerance and respect or whether they are promoting simple lessons of literacy. They truly believe that they can make the world a better place. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for coming. Um, I didn't expect you, but I'm all sort of welled up in tears from that last video. I'm sure you guys are too. This, uh, this has been recorded, so it will be um, on go slash fish. Um, if you guys want to send any of your colleagues there, uh, we'd love for as many people to see this as possible. And as Gary mentioned, we're going to be hosting a, an education forum here in very late October. So stay tuned for more word on that. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gary.